Hello, everyone. I'm Neenu Sharma, Chief Diversity Officer for GE Digital, and I'm really excited to kick off our new Belonging at Work podcast. My goal is to bring additional perspectives, both internal and external, to how we think about diversity, inclusion, and belonging. It seemed fitting to kick off the series with Mike Barber, our Chief Diversity Officer for GE Digital. Mike has spent nearly 40 years with GE in our healthcare business. Mike, thanks so much for being here with me today as our very first guest. So let's jump right in. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and your rise through GE Healthcare? First, you know, thanks for uh, having me. Really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have and getting to know the whole team at GE Digital a bit better. Uh, I'm an engineer by degree. I have an electrical engineering degree um, here in southeastern Wisconsin, the Milwaukee School of Engineering. But, you know, I've always liked science and technology and those things they talk about from an engineering perspective. So when I was in school, I actually didn't take the normal electives. I took my electives in mechanical and software. Uh, those were the three degrees that you could get at that point in time at uh, MSOE. So when I joined GE, I was an intern for, for several years and uh, started in hardware, but very quickly moved into software because the world of microprocessors and signal processing was sort of just getting underway in the uh, early 80s. And so I jumped right in and then had a long career uh, of designing uh, electronics and software and other things uh, in the medical imaging equipment. Moved into leadership, uh, uh, learned that I love uh, growing teams, working with teams, uh, making change to make the company better, serve our customers better. Uh, and then the last several years, I've been running different businesses within GE Healthcare. Great, that is an amazing journey. Um, so I know you were set to retire and then you decided to take on this new ch role of Chief Diversity Officer. What was so appealing about this role that led you to stay with GE a bit longer? Well, as I said, um, the, for me, the power of teams is, is very important. And as Larry was looking to, to sort of change the fabric of GE, uh, getting more operational, pushing more things out to the businesses uh, in terms of the center of gravity. Uh, and we've had had some conversations when I was in operating reviews with Larry, some one-on-ones uh, -on with him around things that happened with respect to diversity, uh, especially when some of the social injustice and racial uh, strife happened earlier in the year. Uh, and that's when we got into a conversation. He asked, would I uh, delay my retirement and, and take on this role? Uh, and for me, you know, high performing teams uh, means you need to have a diversity of thought, a diversity of skills, a diversity of experiences, a diversity of backgrounds and, and, and the like. And so uh, this piece of diversity was important. When I said I was an intern with GE, I started in a scholarship program for minority students interested in engineering. So I have a personal connection to how diversity matters having role models uh, available that I could see, people like me that were in senior roles, what that meant for me, sponsors, mentors, and, and the like. And so uh, really trying to take this space of diversity out of sort of, you know, HR has a huge role to play, uh, but you really have to make sure it's part of the fabric of the business. And so uh, making it sustainable as part of the fabric of the business is what, what the appeal for me was. Yeah, when you uh, mentioned all those pieces um, along the way that really helped you grow, it very resonated with me as well from those mentorship, sponsorship, that representation you see, what you're capable of. So as you look at GE now, what do you believe is our most pressing priority related to our inclusion and diversity efforts? Well, a, a big area is really understanding what's reality. And we, we, we talk about the you know, you know, data a lot, what's, where do we stand uh, with representation, but also with um, inclusion, trying to come up with uh, through surveys and other means, what's an inclusion index? How do people really feel that they are part of the, uh, the organization, that think that their ideas are gonna be valued, their team respects them for who they are and what contributions they, they bring. Uh, so really, it's setting that baseline and getting that base understanding and then moving forward from there is key. And then sort of re reinvigorating some of the affinity networks. Uh, the affinity networks have a huge role to play uh, in that sense of inclusion and belonging and, and keeping the company honest, so to speak, as are the things that we're doing, do they really matter to the general groups at large? And so those are two things that we're really focused on uh, initially. 
Yep. Yeah. It's uh, going going to the data and what that's telling us. And, and sometimes that's the voices of our of our teams. Um, so how do we use lean and the GE behaviors to address our inclusion and diversity priorities? Well, the behaviors from a leadership perspective, you know, staying humble, being transparent, being focused. You know, it, again, it's about developing world class teams, uh, best in class to, you know, we're in complex markets and there's a lot of things that are going on, you know, COVID notwithstanding that just puts more on top. How do we deal with that? How do we handle that? And that you want to have a high performing team to do that. Uh, and so the leadership behaviors around that is key. Uh, and again, diversity and, and as with respect to teams uh, is what's key. And then the other piece, lean is a, a powerful tool set. So uh, as you know, we're using the value stream mapping uh, Kaizen, um, you know, going to Gemba to get data to look at the people development process, really. Uh, and, and are we doing those things which are necessary to make sure we have the pipeline of people uh, uh, to development, uh, to make sure we don't have too much attrition, uh, and using the lean tool set to map out what that means, look for waste, where is their inventory buildup, so to speak, uh, where there's leakage, where there's scrap and quality issues, and then use the tool sets of five whys and fishbone diagrams and solving those problems and coming up with action plans that then you can, you know, gauge progress and, and move forward. And so I think lean is a tool set that we're showing that can be used in, in this world. It's a bit non-standard, but it is showing its applicability to this area. Absolutely. I think uh, when I think about the GE behaviors, it's, um, you know, the act with humility and just recognizing we don't know all the answers on our own. So really um, to solve the big challenges for GE and our customers, we need to have those diverse teams. And then when I think about um, lean, it's when you trust the process, it really helps us get over the target of what we have to meaningfully solve for so we can make a difference. So um, I, I'm a convert, Mike, and um, it's been great to see the, the progress we've been making. There's one thing you talk a lot um, to us at our, at our uh, uh, CDO councils, um, and it's this idea of equality versus equity, and I found that to be very enlightening. Can you share with this group what the difference is and why it's important to understand? Yeah, there's oftentimes um, people talk equality and equity, and they use the terms interchangeably. Uh, and you know, e e equality, you know, making things equal. Uh, you want that with respect to the opportunities that people have, being fair and open about that. But equity is really making sure that you understand the unique needs of a group of people or an individual and that you're able to um, provide the, the resources and the, the activities that are needed for that person such that they can have that equal opportunity. And sometimes that means unequal or something different for one person versus another. The example I like to use, uh, and there's, there's plenty of examples that, that are out there, but thinking of a, a group of consultants that have to do land surveying. Uh, and there's a big fence, a big wall uh, in front of them. And the company gives the uh, three employees that they wanna be able to do this, uh, to look at it from different views, uh, ladders. So they can climb up and look over the fence. Well, one of those employees happens to have a disability and is in a wheelchair. That won't work. Should the company just let them sit on the sidelines and not participate? No, drill a hole through the wall. Uh, if you're able to do that, now that person can participate. Uh, and in fact, if in that, that time doing that survey, it happens to be a forest on the other side. And so those people that scale the wall, they see a bunch of leaves on trees. The person that's looking through that hole can see what's going on at the forest floor, the animals, the river, all those things that are around. So the report that's generated is much, much richer and better because the leader understood equity, not giving them the same thing, not giving them all the latter, but giving them what they needed to be able to perform the work that had to get done. Yeah, um, I, I believe that's going to resonate with with a lot of listeners. How do we build more equity and and how we work um, so we can have the culture that we want here? And to me, that's so connected to this notion of belonging. You know, at G Digital, I've named this year our year of belonging. And so, I would like to ask you, what does a sense of belonging mean to you? It is. Um, it is really. 
we all have jobs. People talk, you come to work, you do those things, but you want to make sure people feel that they're part of the purpose of what we want to achieve, that they have a career. Uh, so inclusion extends into belonging, as you said, so it's key and important. Uh, for the G Digital team, you know, tech, software in general, uh, it's it's um, it's been in the press and a lot of things in terms of not being welcoming to underrepresented minorities or women. Uh, if you look at, you know, and, and look ourselves in the mirror from that perspective. So people can come in and you can be a great uh, software person. You can be a great leader. You can be a great technologist. But if you don't feel like you belong to the you, you buy into the mission of what you want to get accomplished, what you're what you're doing for your customers, your team is excluding you from activities you feel or when you bring up ideas, they're, they're not listening, not responding. You're not going to have that feeling that you belong to part of the organization, part of the team, part of the mission of what's going on. Uh, and we won't get the you, you won't you know, contribute as much as you, you feel you can. And typically that's when people, great people then leave and you get a lot of attrition or if they stay and it's just they're collecting a paycheck, they're not really engaged and they're not giving all their energy and effort uh, to do to solve the problems that we wanna do for our customers. So the feeling of belonging is, is huge. It's a big part of what we have to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel that strongly. Um, so Mike, we're releasing this first podcast on Martin Luther King Day, King Jr. Day. And, um, you know, we celebrate that here in the United States this month. There's a quote from Dr. Quang, King that says, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? How would you answer his question, Mike? I, I'm a believer in, in people, you know, often say servant leadership uh, or the inverted uh, pyramid from leadership perspective. Um, when I talk about teams, uh, how do you help people grow in their careers? Uh, for me, it comes down to my role as a leader is to help make sure uh, the people that are part of my team, the people that are part of the organization can do the things that we're asking them to do. And so I always try to understand how I can help somebody. I try to listen to what it is that they're trying to achieve, make sure the context of what it is that they're doing fits with the business you know, scope of, of what's going on, but then help them provide the resources, provide the coaching, provide the support, support uh, to make those things a reality. And so um, my view is each and every day, every interaction that I have, uh, I wanna listen to what's going on and then provide my input, but then ask, is there more that I can do to help? Yeah, that's great. Um, now, so, Mio, let me ask you, what are you doing to help others? Um, it's a good question, Mike. And, and knowing we were going to have this conversation today, um, I, I was putting a lot of thought to it. One thing that I've been actively thinking about since my son, who is now seven, entered the, the public school system um, is our community and how our community comes together to really support our kids, especially kids uh, in the educational system, because I really think it so much of it starts there. Uh, so one thing that I'm very actively involved with um, in, in his life, uh, in, in our life at home, is uh, we've created this equity squad at our school. And then what it means is after every uh, parent-teacher meeting that we have monthly, we invite people to stay and uh, have a dialogue around um, uh, around equity issues. So this uh, last December at our last meeting, we played a uh, video from um, a Pixar movie. It was one of those shorts, The Pearl, which is about a little ball of yarn who doesn't really fit in, uh, in, in, in the environment. And then we had a discussion and we connected that back to our kids. And those kids, especially in this virtual learning environment, who are feeling very disconnected. They've never met any of their peers in person before. Um, they, you know, they have different things happening at their homes. How do we make them feel um, included? What does that look like as a parent? What does that look like as a teacher? What can we encourage our kids to do during, you know, virtual class time to help encourage that? So it's a small thing. It's you know a thirty-minute dialogue we have collectively, and and we do that month and month and month again, and and hopefully we're making a difference in our community that way. So uh, and I know many of our listeners out there are. Um, 
are, are doing a lot of things like that. And I just invite you to think about Dr. King's words today as, as we celebrate and commemorate that. It is a day of service for many. What is it that we can be doing for others? Um, and, and I hope you've enjoyed our first podcast. We look forward to bringing more voices to you in the future. And Mike, Thank you. Um, I was uh, anxious if you'd have uh, the time and inclination to do this and you couldn't have been more gracious. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Thanks, it's, it was great. It was great to connect. And I know just like you said, but those small things end up being big things. Uh, and that's what it's gonna take as part of the community as you mentioned. So thanks for having me. Okay, great, thank you.